Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Advanced ENL Become a Master. My name is Lexi Johnson. I am our professional liability underwriter here at CID Insurance, and I want to welcome you here today. I want to introduce to you our special guest we have that will, pe uh, that will be presenting today's webinar, James Baker, who is the West Region Team Leader for USLI Professional Lines and an expert in this area. So we're very lucky to have him here today teaching this webinar. I also want to introduce Jacob Cole. He is our marketing coordinator running everything behind the scenes, making sure it goes smoothly. Um, we're actually going to jump right into webinar objectives, and James is going to take it from here. Okay, thanks, uh, Lexi, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for taking the time today uh, as we discuss um, E&L, and, &L, and uh, certainly um, let's just go through this. So we're going to talk about E&L, you know, why purchase it, uh, sample form language, basic coverage differentiators, and then next level coverage differentiators. Just a couple of webinar logistics. Uh, all participants will be defaulted to mute and able to hear but not speak. Questions can be posed in the chat room at any time throughout the webinar, so please feel free to do so. And uh, the more interactive it is, uh, typically um, the better. So here we go. So why do you need errors and omissions coverage? You know, before I read through these, I just, you know, want to point out that predominantly E&O is driven uh, by a contract obligation. So a professional is providing a service for a fee and they are typically required by their client to have an E&O policy in force. That's driven a lot of why you need E&O and then other professions just have it because they are providing a professional service. So. Let's just go through this quickly. Professional liability coverage will protect against the potential devastating effects of lawsuits, regardless of whether or not an allegation has merit. Lawsuits stemming from professional liability claims can incur substantial defense costs and can easily jeopardize a company's financial stability. Even the most uh, conscientious professional can be susceptible to allegations of negligence and the defense costs can quickly accumulate and potentially bankrupt a small business. All professionals that are providing a service are being held to an even higher standard of care than ever before. As a result, professional liability coverage has become essential due to an ever increasing litigious environment. General liability policies, and this is important, specifically exclude professional services and errors and omissions policy is the only way to protect your business from claims arising from performance of these services. Professional liability coverage, what, what does this provide coverage for? Um, the insurance company will pay on behalf of the insured any loss excess of the deductible not exceeding the limit of liability to which this coverage applies, that the insured shall become legally obligated to pay because of a claim first made against the insured during the policy period or if applicable during an extension period, which we'll get into, for wrongful acts of an insured. So professional liability coverage, uh, what a loss means. Loss is damages and settlements, pre-judgment and post-judgment interest, punitive or exemplary damages, criminal or civil fines or penalties. And claims mean one, a demand for money as compensation for a wrongful act, or two, any judicial or administrative proceeding initiated against any insured seeking to hold such insured responsible for a wrongful act, including any appeal therefrom. Wrongful act means any actual or alleged error and omission or negligent act of an insured or person from whom the insured is legally liable in rendering of professional services. And professional service means services rendered to others for a fee solely in the conduct of the insured's profession. Defense inside or outside the limit, why is this important for errors and omissions? So the professional reputation may be on the line. Specialized law firms for these types of claims have higher rates. Lengthy discovery process equals lots of billable hours for lawyers and potentially cost of expert witnesses.
let me just go back. So defense inside or outside the limit, I wanna explain that in more detail. So uh, when you're purchasing a professional liability policy, you have the limit of liability, which would be available for any indemnification that would be owed. Uh, but really when you purchase a, an ENO policy, the biggest piece that you're purchasing is really the defense costs. Um, so with ENO policies, you have you know, basically defense inside or outside the limit. Defense inside would be within the limit of liability that the uh, client or insured purchases. Uh, so if they purchase a $1 million policy, the defense would be inside that limit. And so that would be for both indemnification and the defense, whereas defense outside the limit is separate and standalone. So, you know, with defense costs, exceeding you know high levels a lot of times you want to look for a policy that has defense outside the limit it's more broad coverage and it also allows you know for uh, defense costs that can become potentially very high to be covered whereas if it's inside the limit it would be limited to the limit of liability that's purchased Basic coverage differentiator. So there's duty defend versus reimbursement form. And this is just really on you, you know, how the insurance company will respond to, to claims. So duty defend automatically provides legal counsel for you in the event that you are named in a suit that includes allegations that are covered under the policy so that you won't have to worry about finding legal representation versus reimbursement form reimburse uh, re, this would reimburse policyholders for legal costs associated with the hiring of an outside legal counsel may require pre-authorization. Really, when you're purchasing an ENO policy, again, back to your you're purchasing that defense cost. And with that, you know, the insurance company has specific uh, law firms on retainer to handle specific cases. So um, they're typically utilizing specialized law firms that focus on uh, errors and omission type claims and have the expertise and knowledge to handle those claims. So this is important uh, because a lot of times the business owner isn't going to know how to go about finding the right legal representation. Whereas when they purchase the policy, that's something that's gonna be included within uh, a duty to defend policy. So something to keep in mind. Basic coverage differentiator is continued, so extended reporting provision, which is also known as tail coverage. So just to kind of give a quick overview, um, most, and we'll get into this a little bit further, most professional liability ENO policies um, are written on a claims made basis, which means that the um, claim has to occur and also be reported within the policy period. So when somebody is going to close their business or retire, uh, a lot of times they'll purchase tail coverage, which will extend the reporting period for claims that occurred while their business was in, uh, in an active state. So when we talk about extended reporting provisions, it's also known as tail coverage. Um, there's different uh, types of, of uh, extended reporting provisions. So there's two-way ERP, which is extending uh, reporting period that's offered when either the insurer or insured cancels or doesn't renew a policy. There's one-way ERP, which is unilaterally extended reporting period. Um, extended reporting period only offered when the insured cancels or doesn't renew a policy, AKA one-way ERP. And then there's runoff, an extended uh, reporting period that allows an insured to report claims for a period of time in the future, usually when a professional retires or extends a practice. The runoff coverage is typically uh, designated within the policy form. So that's a specific period of time that they will allow for claims to be reported after the policy is no longer in effect. Whereas the tail coverage, the two-way and the one-way, you typically purchase for an additional premium, uh, usually one, two or three years. Uh, of additional reporting period. So also when you purchase ENO 
uh, policies, it's important to remember uh, and understand the, content, the consent to settle provision, um, which you know is also known as uh, hammer clause or soft softened hammer. So, with a hammer clause, uh, a variation of a settlement opportunity or hammer clause that's most favorable to the insurer and requires the insurer to pay for all defense costs and damages that exceed the recommended settlement offer versus a softened hammer, also known as a velvet hammer. Um, this is a variation of the settlement opportunity or hammer clause that's more favorable to the insured and requires the insured to pay a smaller portion of percentage of the defense costs and damages that exceed the recommended settlement. Some policies contain variations of the settlement provision that allows the insured to settle a claim that falls under the policy's um, SIR amount without the insurer's approval. So just, I know this is a lot of words, but let me explain this. So typically uh, the consent to settle uh, provision within the policy, uh, you know, the insurance company will defend it. And then, you know, typically in most cases before it goes to trial, you know, they'll try to settle it. Uh, and there's times when the insurer, the insured might not want to settle. Uh, because their reputation is on the line, they just believe that they weren't wrong and that they want to, you know, not agree to the insurer, the insurance company and the law firm settlement agreement. In that case, if there's a hammer clause, it won't allow them to have any money above the settlement amount to, to offset claims outside of the settlement agreement versus a softened hammer will provide them uh, the ability to have uh, some coverage above and beyond what the settle amount would be. So if we go to the next slide, all email policies are different. So you should be aware of the of, of this and, and what type of consent to settle clauses are in place. So, for example, most ENO policies contain a hammer clause. There's the hard hammer, which basically means that whatever the settlement amount is, they either accept that or they're on their own, versus an 80-20, meaning that we'll pay, uh, the insurance company will pay 80% uh, of the uh, amount that would be settled, and then the insured would be responsible for 20%. So they would still have coverage if they wanted to take the claim on their own. And then there's the 50-50 and then the 75-25. Um, and then there are some, you know, carriers, although it's not common, where there won't be any hammer clause. So I'll just pause for a minute. Any questions? Okay. So again, we touched upon this briefly, um, you know, claims made versus occurrence. This is important. Um, claims made provides coverage for, someone's gonna this. Oh, great, okay. So um, we do have one question here. Uh, it says, you know, what are some things to watch for when changing uh, carriers? So again, um, at, let me explain the, the claims made and then, I'll, and then I'll answer that question. So claims made versus occurrence. Um, claims made provides coverage uh, for services performed after the retro date as long as policy remains in force. This is the policy form that's typically used. Um, claims made insurance policies are triggered by the making of a claim against an insured during the policy period. Whereas claims made and reported policy, uh, policies that require the claim to be first made within the policy period and reported to the insurer within a designated reporting period as soon as practical. Um, so, so let's just take a quick second. Again, as I indicated earlier, most ENO policies are claims made, which means that the claim has to occur or be uh, reported during the designated policy period. So, you know, let's say that, that you start a policy for an attorney on, um, you know, February 1st of 2023, 
that would be the retro date or the inception date of that policy. So any claims that had happened prior to the inception of the claims made form would not be covered unless you match the retro date, which we'll get into. So it's important to just know that that for most ENO policies, you have to that they're written on a claims made basis and that the claim has to be has to occur within the policy period and in some cases has to be reported within the policy period. Um, then we mentioned laundry listing. This is a practice in which an insured notifies the insurer of a lengthy list of possible uh, situations or claims that could lead to a claim, even though no claims have been received. Um, and then occurrence-based e and it's not typical uh, except for predominantly media policies, uh, which you know typically when a wrongful act can be pinpointed to a specific date, um, a disparaging article published. So most uh, media policies are written on an occurrence basis. So let me just uh, go back to a couple of things. So one of the questions that we have is, um, you know, what things to watch for when changing carriers? One of the biggest things would be making sure that when you change to another insurance carrier, one e and carrier to another, that that carrier is matching the retro date back to when that policy was first written. Because if not, they'll write it on an inception base going forward. So, you know, claims that could occur when that policy was first written wouldn't be covered under the new form. So you always want to make sure that the uh, that the carrier is matching the retro date back to when that first policy was written. As long as there was no lapses in coverage, we wanna make sure that we go back to, to that original inception date. Uh, the other thing you wanna really focus on would be making sure that, that coverage is, is similar, that they're not losing any coverages, making sure that the endorsements or specialized coverages or optional coverages, which we'll get into more, are are also transferring over and so that there's a continuity of coverage. And we have another question here. Um, yeah, so um, the question was, do carriers have one type of hammer clause or do they change per risk type? Uh, that's a great question. So it really does depend on uh, the risk um, and the policy form. So you always want to refer to the policy form because different, you know, most ENO policies will have the same hammer uh, clause. However, uh, it's always very important to make sure that you're looking at each individualized policy form and understand what that consent to settle uh, clause is. So I would just recommend always taking a look at that because it can vary from coverage uh, risk to coverage risk. Uh, insurance carrier form to insurance carrier form. Bear with me here. I'm just. Okay, so now we're going to, you know, we already talked about the retro date, the date when coverage for service provided begins. Uh, ranges from inception to full prior acts. Uh, prior acts, retro date, coverage for claims made during the policy period for wrongful acts that occurred on prior uh, on prior to the policy's effective date. And it's important to match the retro date. So again, you know, always, always being aware that um, that uh, you know the retro date is important. So full prior acts, uh, why would it be in your customer's best interest to have full prior acts? So full prior acts is different than a retro date. A retro date is a specific date when coverage was first written. Full prior acts is, um, for example, if they didn't purchase ENO coverage for the first from the first day that they went into business, this will give them coverage for claims that may arise from services provided in the past that they are unaware may, may give rise to a claim. So, for example, you have a consultant, they have you know, been in business for a couple of years, all of a sudden they're now required to purchase an ENO policy for a specific project that they're going to be working for. And so they purchase an ENO policy. Uh, a lot of times um, 
there is options. Uh, carriers will provide an option to purchase full prior acts coverage for an additional premium so they can take the coverage back to the inception date of when that business was first started. And uh, this will allow coverage for that time period where they didn't purchase coverage uh, for any unknown claims. So again, important to, re to remember, you have you know, inception date, which is the date that they, they first, first purchase coverage. The retro date is that date if they've had coverage in force and now you want to continue to maintain it back to the inception date and then full prior acts would go back to the inception of that individual's business so really pay attention to those those factors so there's the deductible versus the retention you know every policy will have a deductible or a retention there is some differentiation a deductible uh, is, is categorized as a portion of the insured's loss or damages that must be paid before the insurer has any duty to indemnify. So they have to pay their, their, their deductible and then anything over that deductible amount up to the limit of liability would be, would be covered by the insurance company. Uh, first dollar defense, uh, so, so this means that even though there's a deductible, uh, it doesn't apply to the defense costs. So meaning if there's indemnification that needs to be paid out, they need to pay the deductible, but for the defense to be triggered on the policy, that does, the deductible does not apply. And then you also have your retention, uh, and this is different than a deductible in the point, fact that the amount of loss that will be paid by the insurer before their insurance becomes affected. So basically they have to pay whatever the retention is uh, before the insurance company will will trigger defense or indemnification. So again, just important to remember there is there is a difference and and different policy forms will either provide a deductible uh, or a retention and to be aware of those. Another important thing to remember um, is independent contractor coverage. So in this case, um, you want to make sure that if an insured has independent contractors that are providing services on their behalf, that they are covered. Different policies uh, will either cover independent contractors within the policy form, or they have to be specifically endorsed to the policy. So when you're looking at E&O coverage, you want to make sure that you are aware of how independent contractors are covered if the insured has independent contractors working on their behalf. So, you know, just to, to typically go through, um, forms typically provide coverage for the acts of independent contractors provided on their behalf. And as we mentioned, uh, you know, be sure to have these services listed within the description of operations. If outside of a traditional scope, you know, look for exclusions for independent contractors and independent contractors covered as insureds within the definition of who is an insured. So again, um, you just wanna be aware if they have independent contractors that they uh, that the policy is covering them. Uh, so, you know, punitive damages coverage, um, e and insurance can cover the cost of damages uh, subjected to policy limits, including punitive damages, but typically this is based on if it's allowed by the state. So certain states allow you know, policies to pick up punitive damages and some don't um, because punitive damages are assessed on top of, of other damages amounts for you know extreme wrongdoings. So you know just be aware of that when you're writing writing an ENO policy that that you know, if it is in a state where punitive damages are allowed to be covered, that that the policy does extend to those uh, to those types of claims. Um, and then again, often not covered or sublimited in many forms. Sublimits are not appropriate for an exposure, which by its very nature is meant to be high dollar. Again, these are damages above and beyond based on the the 
the the type of claim or or damage that has occurred to punish the individual in addition to whatever other damages have been offered. So personal injury coverage, um, this is another important piece to remember. Uh, guards against suits claiming one wrongful entry or eviction or other invasion of private uh, occupancy or two, the publication or utterance of a libel or slander or other defamatory or disparaging material. Three, a publication or utterance constituting an invasion, infringement or interference with a third party's right of privacy or publicity or four, false arrest, detention, or imprisonment, or malicious prosecution. This is while providing professional services for others. So, uh, you know, personal injury on an ENO policy is not the same as a personal and advertising injury on a GL form. So it's important to remember that. So let's uh, give an example of a personal injury uh, by a claims example. Bonnie and Lance decided to hire Morgan Image photographers to capture images of their newborn son. They meet with the photographers at Morgan Image and sign the standard contract offered by the studio. They are thrilled with the results when they receive the proof book. Three months later, when Bonnie's friend is viewing the Morgan Image's website, she sees the photo of Bonnie's son as part of the sample images and calls Bonnie to let her know. Bonnie is irate seeing what she felt was a private image and moment now displayed on the website. After a phone call to the studio, she learns that the contract she signed states that images can be used for promotional purposes without her consent. Despite this fact, she sues Morgan Images. So although Morgan Images wins the case because their contract allows this and the insurer and the and the client signed it, um, there still was defense costs, which totaled $78,000. So again, you know, it's important to have e and sh insurance to pick up the, uh, the defense costs. And again, this relates back to personal injury definition of invasion, infringement, or interference with a third party's right to privacy. So now we're gonna kind of get into some next level coverage differentiators. And this is really driven by the type of business that the individual is involved in. One of the big uh, differentiating coverages that can be added to, to ENO insurance policies or built into the form would be intellectual property coverage. And this is for you know copyright infringement, title, slogan, logo infringement, trademark, trade name, trade dress infringement. So an intellectual property claim means a claim alleging infringement of a registered copyright title, slogan, logo, trademark, trade name, service mark, or trade dress in the performance of professional services by an insured. And again, this would be anyone who's designing or developing content or logos. Uh, so this would be important for you know creative professions such as advertising agencies, marketing consultants, graphic web designers. Again, you know, the typical uh, claim would be, you know, somebody is opening up a coffee shop and they go to a graphic designer to develop a logo and the logo is closely referenced to like a Starbucks logo. So again, they can, you know, file suit for an intellectual property claim against that graphic designer uh, and, you know, the policy will respond if this coverage is included. And we'll just give a quick intellectual property claim example. Uh, Jane Smith has been programming for Custom Developer Incorporated, a large IT firm for five years, designing enterprise management systems. Due to a decrease in orders, the software company must cut expenses and went through a wave of layoffs, which included Jane. Jane Smith decides to start her own business that will specialize in enterprise management systems. Since, there, since this is where her expertise lies, she develops a new package software product that provides enterprise management for small businesses. Custom developer, her employer in the past, feels that the software code used in her new software is their copyrighted code and files suit against Jane for copyright trademark infringement. Very similar to like Apple versus Samsung uh, and the claims that have occurred you know, between those two um, technology companies. Uh, and one thinking that the other stole their intellectual property coverage. Uh, 
So another uh, coverage would be bodily injury and property damage arising out of professional services. So, um, you know, there's, there's times where uh, not only will bodily injury and property damage suits be brought against a GL policy, but also against a professional policy due to the negligence of their professional services. Um, this is also known as contingent BIPD. Uh, important for design and medical classifications, example like interior designers. Uh, it basically removes the bodily injury or property damage exclusion on the PL form. So it eliminates the gray area between the PL and GL form. So again, uh, you know, certain classifications like landscape architects, interior designers, professional organizers, home stagers, contractors, architects and engineers, you know, let's say that a, an architect designs a building and then, you know, it's found that there was professional liability negligence that occurred and, you know, a, a piece of the structure falls and actually, you know, creates a bodily injury or a property damage. They can go back and say, well, this person is providing a professional service as a trusted advisor and an expert. So we can also go after them on the pro on the professional liability form if they can if they carry the contingent BIPD coverage, then coverage would be available to offset some of those exposures. Third party discrimination coverage. Um, this is important. Uh, provides protection for discrimination to a third party in the course of providing a professional service. Uh, so any uh, you know basically outside of the insurer and the client, any third party. So, you know, real estate agent, property management, event planner, photographers, caterers, you know, they're dealing with individuals outside of their contract, which are also known as third parties. Um, and those third parties can bring suit against an insured. And you wanna make sure that the policy would cover third party exposure and it complements an EPL policy. Uh, so to kind of continue, uh, contractually required clauses. So a lot of times, you know, the contracts will require that these coverages are in place. Um, you know, additional insured, blanket additional insured coverage. You know, clients want to be protected if named in a suit related to the insured's professional service. So they'll be asked to be added as an additional insured. Waiver of subrogation. You know, waiving the right for the insurance company to collect reimbursement from the insurance company of the other party. So basically they don't want, you know, the, the, the client doesn't want their insurance to be affected by the services that are provided by uh, the, per, you know, professional liability insured. Um, so, so they waive the subrogation. Primary non-contributory, this is priority of coverage when two policies are excess over one another, then, you know, one will be primary over the other. And then there's cross liability, typically a GL endorsement that provides coverage in connection with a suit brought against an insured by another party that has insured status. It basically removes an insured versus insured exclusion. Um, you know, pro bono coverage, you know, certain uh, professional services, accountants, lawyers, uh, you know, they'll provide some of their services on a pro bono basis. You want to be sure that the professional liability uh, policy that they're purchasing will have uh, uh, professional services um, to pick up pro bono uh, or uh, charitable purposes arising solely in the conduct of the insured's profession. So again, just, just make sure that the policy that you're writing, you know, picks up pro bono services. Some other, you know, types of coverages that you can look for uh, that that are provided in certain, uh, you know, policy forms would be reputation restoration expense coverage. So, like public relations costs needed to combat adverse uh, publicity stemming from a claim, subpoena, supplemental payments, disciplinary actions coverage. So again, this would be reasonable attorney fees, excluding uh, disbursement relating to an insured's reasonable and necessary response to a subpoena for documents or witness testimony rising or resulting from professional services rendered by an insured. Supplemental payments coverage for lost wages to attend trials, hearings, and defense of a claim. And coverage for attorney fees, costs, expenses incurred by the named insured in defending against investigations, disciplinary actions uh, by licensing boards. 
identity theft, uh, you know, credit monitoring, um, and and fees associated with identity theft uh, covered under the policy. Coverage for owned properties, you know, we see this on like um, property management forms where you know you want to make sure that that it removes the exclusion for properties managed by an owner. So if the individual owns the property but it is also utilizing it as a as a rental uh, that they also have coverage because sometimes the policy will exclude uh, coverage for managed by owner properties. Kidnap expense, retaining an independent negotiator or consultant to facilitate the release of a kidnapping victim. Uh, technology product coverage. I think this is very important. Um, means of communication or telecommunication hardware, software product, or related electronic document that's created, manufactured, or developed by the name insured for others, or distributed, licensed, leased, or sold by the name insured to others for compensation, including software updates, service packs, and other maintenance releases provided for such products. Um, you know, description of operations, you want to make sure that, um, you know, broad versus specific definitions of professional services, um, carriers' willingness to modify. So, again, the way that professional liability policies work is the professional definition is where the coverage lies. So, you know, you want to make sure that whatever professional services are that the insured is doing, that they're listed underneath the uh, professional service definition. For technology accounts, I think this is important, um, including but not limited to language for tech accounts. Um, technology is changing all the time, and it's very hard to kind of keep up with all the differing changes. So one of the things you want to look for when you're writing a tech account is that the computer technology services include language uh, that you know, sets up including but not limited to to computer consulting and then a list of, of the services. But if there's additional technology components that come into play, this included but not limited to would extend coverage. So it's important to, to note that when you're writing technology policies. Um, the next is dealing with cyber coverage. So, uh, Obviously, this is a huge piece, and uh, you know there's been cyber breaches occurring, and it's starting to occur more regularly all the time. Uh, it's important that the errors and omissions policy extends privacy breach liability, which is third-party coverage, and then uh, cyber privacy breach expense, which is first-party. And let me just explain first and third-party because this can get confusing. First-party coverage helps you respond to data breaches on your own network or system. So, you know, personal identifiable information on your own laptop, uh, it gets compromised um, and you have, you know, you've now exposed your client's uh, personal identifiable information. That would be, um, you know, first party. Third party, this is a lot of times for uh, like technology companies that helps pay for lawsuits caused by data breaches on a client's network or system. So example, you're a software developing company you develop a piece of software, it's put onto your client's uh, systems and that software is compromised or breached and it exposes your client, that's where third-party coverage will, will take place. Uh, a management consulting, and so here's kind of an example, uh, a management company, uh, the consultant loses a laptop while working on a project for a client. The laptop held data on the client's customers, including email addresses and bank account information. A cloud computing company holds personal records of over a thousand different companies. The cloud computing company has a data breach and all the companies must inform their clients of the data breach. Again, this is first party. Coverage does vary greatly from carrier to carrier, so be on the lookout. Complete coverage uh, covers both first and third party exposures. So, you know, a couple things to ask, is this identity collecting, storing, or transmitting personal identifiable information directly from the consumer? If yes, the entity has a first party exposure. 
And again, entities with first party exposure almost always have third party exposure as well. So you wanna make sure that you have first and third party cyber coverage to have a comprehensive cyber policy. Legal foundation for claims, um, a professional duty exists. Uh, so again, you, you know, when you're providing a professional service, you're, you're held to a higher standard of care. Breach of that duty or failure to confirm to the standards of that duty by the defendant, which is negligence, a casual connection between the conduct and resulting injury, proximate cause, and damage resulting to the plaintiff from the negligent act, error, or omission of the defendant. And again, we kind of touched on this earlier, important things to review when presenting a carrier's terms. You wanna make sure that um, you, you know, you're know you aware of the retro date, uh, make sure if they've had previous coverage that the retro date is matched. You wanna make sure you understand you know, the retention versus the deductible looking at whether or not defense is inside versus outside coverage territory. So most uh, e &O policies are worldwide. Uh, however, a lot of times the coverage will be worldwide. However, claims need to be filed within the US, Canada or its territories and litigated. So if you have a company that is doing a lot of international work, you wanna make sure that you have a policy that's true worldwide, uh, which means that claims uh, can be made and reported anywhere in the world. So again, look at that coverage territory and understand your risk and exposure. Include, included or excluded common coverages, again, we touched on personal injury, intellectual property, discrimination, network and privacy liability, uh, and then you know, be on the lookout for those exclusions. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Lexi. Thank you, everyone, and uh, happy to answer any questions also. Perfect. Thank you so much, James. That was great. I really enjoyed listening to you and appreciate all your insight and time. Um, so we included our target professional liability classes that we write. This is not all of them, but it shows you a variety of what we can consider. Jacob will be sending this out to you after the webinar. Um, if you have any questions about a specific risk that you are working on or any questions in general, um, please give me a call or send me an email. I'd be happy to work with you. Um, and this actually brings us to our last slide. If you need um, specific applications, we actually have them on our website at cidinsurance.com. We also have recorded webinars about different topics and many tools that you can have access to to help you along the way, such as claim examples or quote templates. Um, again, Jacob will be sending some material to you after the webinar and a short survey um, for you to complete so we can get some feedback. So thank you so much again for joining. I really look forward to working with you and I hope you have a great rest of your day.